All right, let's try this again, gentlemen. Okay, everybody, hopefully you have got the uh, audio feed now. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I think we've got everything on track. If not, let us know in the comments below. So, as I was saying before, welcome back to The Branson Show. I'm Dane Braden, and uh, tonight we are joined by two very special guests, and I want to give you a, a brief intro background on each of them so you know where they're coming from and uh, how and why they're qualified to speak on these matters. So, first up, we have Brad Lepper. Brad, it's good to see you again. Hey, Dane. Hey, Dane. Uh, Brad is a successful entrepreneur. He is a uh, coffee shop owner, loving husband, and father of two uh, with uh, specialties in real estate development and investments. And uh, as I've said, he does own a chain of coffee shops. It's called Stone Brew Coffee, and in my opinion, it's better than Starbucks. So, Brad, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Dan. And uh, our next guest is Dr. Scott Taylor. And uh, this is the first time I'm meeting you, uh, so it's nice to vir <laughs> virtually meet you, Scott. You too, Dan. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, now, Scott has quite the uh, rap sheet, so to speak. Uh, I want to go over some of his background and credentials so that our viewers understand uh, just how qualified he is to talk on the matters of viruses, vaccines, disease, etc. So, uh, Dr. Taylor got his Bachelor of Science degree in biology and chemistry at Iowa State University. He also got his doctorate of veteran medicine, veterinary medicine there. Uh, he did graduate studies in immunology and he's conducted research at the National Animal Disease Center, the USDA Laboratory Analysis of Vaccines, and the Center for Veterinary Biology. He was a biologic epidemiologist at the Center for Veterinary Biology, once again, USDA, owned his own mixed animal clinic. It was a private practice. He's also the owner and founder of Applied Botanicals Incorporated, and he has authored three books on health and nutrition, specializing in prevention and mitigation of inflammation and disease. And I'm sure that's not all. He did remind me shortly before we went live that the only thing I forgot to add to his credentials is that he is now retired. <laughs> so I'm, yes. I'm so glad you could join us. I've really been looking forward to this interview. And Brad, I thank you again for, uh, for coordinating, coordinating this and putting us in touch. Uh, Absolutely. And the other, other thing to add to his uh, list of accomplishments, he's my wife's father. So that's how we're connected. And yes. So he, a uh, big thank you goes out to Scott. Uh, we started talking about this a, a few months ago. And thanks to his expertise, kind of gave me a heads up on what was coming. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, I think I've got a decent, hang on just a second. Oh, from the button, gotcha. There we go. Um, I think I've got a pretty decent outline put together for the course of our conversation this evening and we're just going to loosely stick to this because I really want to allow uh, some time and some space for both of you to expand on these topics or add anything that we may have missed in preparation for this. Um, so let me give you a little backstory. Uh, Brad, when did we first discuss the seriousness of coronavirus? I would, think, I would it think it was probably, probably was, it was it maybe, maybe early, early February, February mid-February when you and I talked the first time about it. I think that's about right because um, I'll be perfectly honest with our viewers. At that point in time, I was not taking coronavirus as seriously as I should have. After my conversation with Brad, I uh, changed my tune very quick. I started to do my own research and really looked into what was going on, and it was quite alarming, to be honest. Um, so, and then, you know, Brad, where he was getting a lot of his information was, of course, from Dr. Taylor. So, 
I guess I want to start by asking this. Um, Scott, when did you first start following the coronavirus? I, d I don't know the exact time, but I it was I in January, I think mid to maybe the second half of January, sometime in there, that I it kind of hit my radar and, and started paying attention to it. Anytime I knew what we call a novel virus comes out of China, it's, it's on my radar. And just real quick, what, what constitutes as a novel virus? A novel virus means it's new, um, meaning that it's not one that's been circulating around in our population or in the world. So it's a new emerging disease, brand new. And the reason that's important is because our, our immune systems have not been exposed to it. So that what that, that's called is being naive. Our immune, our immune systems are naive to this virus. And the problem with that is we don't have any immunity to it. And obviously, um, a new virus like that in a population that's naive can spread <coughs> rapidly if it's, contag if it's contagious. So, uh, Well, what did you see early on that, that alerted you, you know, I need to start warning my friends and family that something's coming. There's something to this. Right. Well... well uh, a, novel a novel virus, virus coming out of China is the first alert, um, and that puts it on my radar. And anybody that's familiar with emerging diseases will, will do that. The other thing is it was, it was – um, word was coming out that it, was, it had human-to-human -human, the ability to have human-to-human -human transmission, which is key. Um, because there's, there's been other viruses that come out of China, like the H7 – N9 influenza, which was transmitted from chickens to humans, but it never adapted uh, from human to human contact or, or, or transmission, I mean. And it was very, um, very pathogenic. It caused a lot of disease and the mortality rates were relatively high. Um, so that was, that was a big concern uh, coming out of China, but luckily it never adapted to be able able to um, people, only from birds to people, never from people to people. This one, this one is a new virus and has the ability to transmit between people, and it's also very contagious. So it means it transmits rapidly and easily between people. And being new, again, it's novel, so our immune systems haven't seen it, so it's going to spread rapidly, and, and we don't have an immune system that, that's um, protective for it. If a virus, a new virus, like say if we get a new seasonal flu or a, another cold virus that comes out, you know, our, our immune systems have, have some, some experience and, and memory to those. So it won't rapidly spread, spread throughout, throughout our, our population, population because, because some people, people are immune to it. To it. In, this In this case, case the, whole the whole world was naive. naive. Nobody, Nobody had immunity to this new virus. virus. So that's, 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 that's a big, a big problem. problem. Absolutely. Um, and Brad, what would you say were the things that you saw early on? Because I know that you and Scott were tracking this together around the same time frame. Uh, what were some of the right. things that you saw that were alarming to you? And, and in fact, yeah, I would well, love to know, you know, what did you see that spurred you to call me? I greatly appreciated the heads up. <laughs> so I wasn't paying attention to it at all until Scott called me in, in mid-January and, uh, told me, you know, hey, this could get bad. And uh, I've known Scott for a long time, and we've had a pretty close relationship. So um, I kind of just laughed at him a little bit. And I said, ah, you know, well, these things happen all the time. Doesn't, not going to come here. It won't affect us. I'm not worried. And uh, he said, no, no, this one is different. And uh, knowing his background, I figured I better listen to him. <laughs> and so we started doing some digging together. And I think the thing that besides my conversations with Scott, um, the thing that really got me looking was the response from China. That as soon as I saw them quarantining a city of 12 million people in Wuhan, uh, then entire Hubei province, and then other regions and provinces in China, um, and I saw empty highways and empty downtowns, uh, I knew that this was something different, something we'd never seen before. 
And even though the Chinese were saying there was something going on by late January, uh, the WHO and the, the CCP were still being pretty coy about the, the depth of their problem. Uh, and they remain that way today. But it was, it was really seeing how they responded um, and a whole lot less about what they were saying that got me to take it seriously. And Scott and I kind of started tag team in the information and uh, we, we'll have to publish our, our text thread someday because it's, <laughs> it's pretty interesting to watch our understanding of the situation evolve over time. Yeah. Yeah. As it unraveled in real time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and this is one of those situations where it would seem to me as though actions speak louder than words. So what they were saying was not necessarily in line with what they were doing. And, and when I say they, right now I'm referring to the Chinese government. So could you maybe elaborate a little bit more uh, for our viewers as to what you were seeing them do in response specifically that, uh, that didn't quite seem kosher, if that makes sense? Well, I think, well, I think seeing the shutdowns, seeing the shutdowns of, the cities, of the cities, knowing, knowing um, um, that they were closing, they were factories, closing factories, um, seeing, um, seeing them, put, seeing the them put the military out into the street to enforce, to enforce um, um, I, I would say, I would say a, communist a communist dictatorship, dictatorship like, like, the CCP, like the CCP depends on, depends their, on their people being occupied, being occupied and fed, and, fed, and, fed um, um, and, content. and content, and so to, and see, so to them see them allow all of those things to be put aside and lock down entire regions. Um, um, that, that just that, that they, just they, weren't, they, they willing weren't willing to destroy their, their economy, their economy um, um, for nothing. For nothing. So, they so they knew something, they knew something was very serious early on, early on um, and, and they knew, and they, and had they, knew they had to try and get a handle, handle, on, get a handle on, on it. And that's why they took such extreme measures, measures early, early. Gotcha. And they and they, and they knew, knew that with that SARS. SARS. This this was this is unprecedented action from them. And you're right. It's it's you don't listen to what they say. You watch what they do. Yeah, and that was. And I think that those actions were significant. And I think one of the biggest things that Scott told me, and Scott, maybe if you can explaining the difference between a DNA virus and an RNA virus, because that was really critical to help me understand why this one was going to be harder to tame than than other viruses in the past. Yeah. Um, so you can divide viruses in those two ways. There, it's the nuclei acid, the coding, the genetic coding in them, and some of them are RNA viruses and some of them are DNA viruses. The characteristics of the DNA is that they're very robust and stable. They don't change over time. They replicate and they're accurate about their replication. They copy correctly, so they, they produce exact copies and don't change very much. RNA are opposite of that. RNA are unstable. They vary a lot, and when they copy, they make a lot of mistakes. So they're very variable, and that can lead to different strains, some some more virulent than others, or some not as virulent. So they're they're a moving target. They're like camouflage to the immune system in a way because they they're not the same uh, every strain that you see or exposed to. So they're a, when it comes to vaccines, they're a challenge. Uh, influenzas, RNA viruses, uh, our common colds are RNA viruses. So those those make it hard to to produce vaccines for because they change so so uh, dynamically. So this is an elementary question, but it's really for clarification. With COVID nineteen, or I'm sorry, coronavirus, are we <laughs> dealing with a DNA virus or an RNA virus? It's, it's the, the coronaviruses, coronaviruses are RNA, RNA viruses. viruses. Which makes yeah. it that much harder to predict because it replicates right. in such an unpredictable way. Yeah, yeah and that, that, that also led to the emergence of this new novel virus itself. itself. See, it's, this, this is, has, has not, not been out there circulating in our in the human uh, population, population, and it, it changed, changed somehow. somehow. And, and here we go. go. This, this is, is it. it. It's a new it's one. A new one. Hmm. And I, and I, think I think it's important, too, that, too, that uh, uh, I, I say the word coronaviruses, Scott, and, and that this isn't got its name and everybody calls it coronavirus, but there are all kinds of coronaviruses. Oh, but yeah. this is a, the, the important <clears throat> thing about this one to understand is it's a new strain. Uh, it's a novel coronavirus. It's a new version. 
A lot right. of people were showing the back of Lysol cans and stuff saying, well, here, we've had coronavirus forever. This is all made up. And it's like, well, you're right. We have had coronaviruses for a very long time. I've identified them, but this is a new version. Right. Yeah. And practically all species of, of animals have coronaviruses, our pigs and cats and uh, and cattle. Uh, we all have, and humans, we all have coronaviruses. Usually they stay within the species and don't transmit too much. But if they jump from one to another, then, then you, a lot of times that's a change in that virus. And in the unique case of uh, China, they have, they have these odd or unique human, human and animal, animal um, um, platforms, platforms or, 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 or husbandry, husbandry practices, practices so that they're, that they're exposed, exposed and have and close and close, close contact, contact with, each with each other. other. So, it's so it's almost the perfect, perfect breeding ground for these RNA, RNA viruses. viruses. And that's, and that's why, why a lot of these, these deadly, deadly pandemic, pandemic viruses, viruses come, come from China. China. I see. So I saw that one of the early publications that came out of China was that they felt pretty certain that this particular strain originated from bats. What is your take on that? Well, bats, well, bats, bats are bats. a problem when it comes to, to viruses. They've got, they carry a lot of nasty things. Um, and I don't doubt that it, it has some history within a bat, but um, the the trans the the jump from the bat to the human directly may not have occur have have occurred. They they think maybe there's an intermediate species, which which can happen often. A lot of times, for example, I think the um, the flus will a lot of times go jump from poultry, from birds to pigs, and then from pigs to humans, and then back and forth. So there's usually an intermediate species between uh, the original species and the human okay uh, so let's talk let's talk about vaccines um, and maybe we should just start with a basic understanding how do vaccines work vaccines, vaccines work, to, work stimulate to stimulate the immune, the immune system, system to protect, to protect against, against, that against that specific, specific pathogen, pathogen. It's, it's it's a it's controlled, controlled exposure, exposure which which then provides an immune response that that pr produces an, an anamnestic response which means memory so that your your immune system has the ability to to remember things remember antigens and those antigens are specific for uh, particular viruses and bacteria that we call pathogens and that anamnestic response can last a lifetime or maybe just a few months or years depending on the 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 depending on the vaccine and or the, the, the pathogen itself. But, um, so vaccines are a controlled exposure to produce an anamnestic response in, in your immune system, protect you from, from exposures of, of real um, field strains that are virulent that can cause disease. So the, the vaccines are usually attenuated or modified live, which means that they won't cause disease, but they will cause an anamnestic response, immune response. Okay. So what do you think are some of the major hurdles or obstacles that we're going to be facing in pursuit of a vaccine for this? Well, well um, RNA, RNA viruses, viruses don't, lend don't lend themselves well, well to, vac to vaccines, vaccines and, and coronaviruses, coronaviruses are... are RNA, RNA viruses. viruses. Um, um, we don't we have, have um, um, SARS, SARS came, came out several, several years, years ago. ago. We, we don't have, have a vaccine for it. it. So, so um, the, the coronavirus has caused a common cold, cold the, the rhinoviruses, rhinoviruses and coronaviruses. And coronaviruses. So, so it's, it's like, like, you know, if, if, if vaccines would be effective, effective for that, you'd think they, they, we would have them, them but they don't because they, they, they change, change their dynamic and it's, it's, it's a challenge, challenge to produce a vaccine. It's a, like, like I said, it's a moving target. target so you're designing a vaccine, vaccine but over time, over time that thing, this, this, the, the, virus, the virus itself, itself keeps changing, changing and it makes it a challenge. challenge. Now they, now have, they, have, they have, have said this one seems to be somewhat stable and it might be a candidate for a vaccine. The problem is... This, this thing's spreading, spreading so fast, fast by, by the time, time a vaccine, vaccine is available, it's, it's going to be primarily too late. late. I see. So for, for the Western 
world, Western Hemisphere, um, are we past that prevention point? Like, in other words, is it already too late for the vaccine? Yeah, yeah, for the, for the most part, because um, um, most, most likely we're all going to be exposed to this sometime within the next, I'd probably, probably say, 16, 16 months or so, so. Um, maybe, maybe a year and, and a half. And, and, and a vaccine, and a vaccine if, if, if successfully uh, produced, produced that's, that's safe and effective, and effective it'll, come it'll come out about that same time. time. So it's, it's, it's kind of after, after the fact. fact. So, so, so it's too so late, it's too really, late really, to be that helpful. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, that you, you did mention 16 months, which is quite an extended time frame. And, you know, you've got all these different media sources predicting different lengths of time that this is going to be with us. Uh, given your history and your background, um, do you think we're in for, for a longer ride with coronavirus? You know, some people are hoping, well, it, it, the, the, Warmer temperatures may mitigate the spread a bit. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Um, I I'm, I'm kind of concerned, concerned about that because I don't think it's, it's going to act like the flu. flu. I, I think this this, this thing, thing spreads by contact. contact. Um, I, I think, think it, it tolerates the the, temp, the the heat a little bit better and humidity because uh, it, it might not spread, spread as well. Aerosol and and um, airborne in the humid, humid, warmer climates, but it still spreads very rapidly by contact and very effectively by contact. So I still think even this summer could be a problem in certain areas. So I, I am concerned that, that everybody, all the pundits are saying that it's not going to be a problem until again, next, next fall. And I don't, I'm not sure about that. I I'm suspicious that that's wrong. Yeah. Well, and we've seen we've seen spread in tropical climates, um, subtropical climates already, which I think kind of shows that even Australia has had their cases with spread, which they're at the end of their summer. So um, we, we're seeing spread in all different temperature zones of the world. So yeah, the, 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 this is not the flu. And you know, I'm so glad you said that because that was actually my next question. Uh, you know, a lot of people. Uh, media and just personal, you know, the average uh, citizen on their social media, a lot of people are comparing this to the flu and saying, well, the flu killed X amount of people last year and X amount of people the year before that. But could you please explain to us why COVID, coronavirus and, and COVID-19 is different from the flu? Well, for one, it's a, it's, it's a completely different virus. Um, it has some, some similarities, but the, the difference that are in, that are important is obviously this is a novel virus. We haven't really had a novel influenza spread through. So going back to that discussion we had about it, this whole population, our whole global population is naive to this virus. Well, that's not the case for influenza. We, we all have some immunity to influenza. It's just it changes a little bit, but we have partial immunity. So that's a big, that's a big uh, uh, difference in it in right there. The other thing is um, this, the spread of this virus just started a, f a few months ago. So this, this story is just getting started. Influenza story, we're, we've had that story going on for years and decades. So um we, we should talk about this, you know, in about 18 months when this spreads around the world and everybody's been exposed to it. And then we can compare. But right now, there's, it's apples and oranges. There's no comparison to it because this is just getting started. Gotcha. Um, now, I've also heard people talk about, and Brad, we talked about this. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about, well, the coronavirus didn't kill this victim or COVID-19 didn't kill this victim. It was the pneumonia that killed them or it was some other underlying health problem that killed them, but it wasn't coronavirus. And so our, our death toll rates are, are incorrect. Um, what would you say to that? Well, I think, uh, when we talked the other night, I believe I said that, uh, viruses cause pneumonia, pneumonia can't cause a virus. 
Um, and the viruses don't come up with new symptoms just out of the blue. It's not like we have a virus that will make your skin turn purple polka dots or come up with some strange thing. They, they, they create uh, immune responses in your body. Uh, they create infections and those manifest themselves in different symptoms. And there's only so many things that your body's going to do. Um, and Scott, I think you probably can talk, you can talk a lot about uh, the inflammation and immune response associated with this particular uh, disease. Yeah. And just a, just kind of a quick overview of what inflammation is. That's an immune response to an injury or an infection. Um, and actually, actually the, inflammation the inflammation is what causes, causes disease. disease. So, so you can have, have the virus, the virus it, it triggers inflammation, and the inflammation causes the disease. disease. So that's, 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 that's what, what happens. happens. Now, that, that can be triggered in the lungs, lungs which, which would, would cause, cause pneumonia. pneumonia. But, it, but, this but this virus, here's another, another thing, thing that's not, not like, like the flu. The flu usually is just a respiratory infection. So it's going to stay within the respiratory tract. This virus can go in a lot of different different, um, systems. systems. It can be in the the GI GI tract. It can be in the neurological neurological system. system. It can be in muscle. It can be in the the cardiovascular cardiovascular system. system. So So this thing thing is is a lot more challenging challenging, uh, because because it it, it, it can can attack attack all the systems systems basically within within our body. And if you have inflammation with any of those systems, Systems and that will, will trigger, trigger a disease, a disease within, that within that system. So, so for example, if for it example, if it attacks your GI tract, you're, tract, you're going to have you know nausea, uh, nausea and, and diarrhea, like things like that. So and that's you so and that's that you see that in some of the cases. I think about 30 30 percent of the cases will have GI involvement. involvement. So, so so nearly a third of the cases have GI tract issues. We just hear more about respiratory issues. Well, I think the respiratory well, think the can respiratory get so severe, so severe that it, that it, and, and acute, acute that, that that's that's, um, that, that's the probably, probably the most, most de- deadly um, disease that it causes. But at at this point in time, especially with confirmed cases and the death toll rising, do you think it's a good expenditure of time, money, and resources to use testing kits on deceased victims to try and confirm that it was, in fact, the coronavirus? Or can we be reasonably sure, based on the symptoms, that's what happened? Yeah, um, well, I'm not a pathologist, but if you're, if you... (laughs) If you have an infection that triggers a pneumonia and a cardiac arrest, because inflammation can do that, you know, the pathologist may classify that as cardiac arrest and pneumonia, not as coronavirus. coronavirus. That, that so, gets to be kind of muddy. And as, as far as using, using tests on, on you know, post-mortem, post-mortem I, you, know, you know, we don't, we don't have, have enough tests right, right now for... for for, for uh, monitoring and surveilling, and surveilling what, what this outbreak's doing. doing. So, so I would say, um, it, it, we're, we're better, better off, you know, testing um, people to see what the disease is doing, so we can make wise wise decisions and and better um, take better action to control the disease than than looking backwards. We need to be looking forward. Yeah. And from the the uneducated perspective over here, uh, just the casual observer, the particular symptoms for coronavirus is both both sides of the lungs get infected, which that's fairly uncommon. A lot of times you just have one or the other. There's also issues um, that I've been seeing where the blood is extremely dark with coronavirus patients, which is caused by a lack of the oxygen getting into the blood, which Again, I'm no doctor, but that's just what I've read. So I think that there are a lot of signs within coronavirus that, that are, are pretty good markers to tell us what caused this person to, to suffer their fate. Um, and I think in order for us to uh, forecast and plan and try and, and head this thing off at the pass, um, we have to make the best decisions we can with the data we have available in the field and the tools we have available. Uh, and so to, uh, there's been a lot of... People sending videos around saying that the CDC is inflating numbers and that uh, doctors are putting coronavirus on 
their death certificates just to get more funding. Um, I think it's a little bit naive as to the gravity of the situation we're dealing with. And in a lot of these hospitals, just what their workload is. Um, they have to do that in order to be able to be effective and track this thing as it grows uh, and show the severity of it. Absolutely. And can you, can you elaborate just a little bit more on reporting uh, coronavirus as the cause as a ploy to get funding? We talked about this yesterday yeah, yeah. and made a comparison, and it was, I felt like it was pretty enlightening. The uh, Laura, Laura Ingram, Ingram, I think, I think had, had an, expert an expert on the other, the other night, night that was explaining how the CDC um, or, or whichever government, government agency is funding the hospitals, hospitals is doing it based off of caseload, um, where, where if they, they have, have a suspected case uh, in, their in their hospital, hospital I believe they're getting around $13,000. Uh, uh, if they put, put them on a ventilator, ventilator it's like $43,000. So the implication of the interview was that doctors are – misdiagnosing or liberally diagnosing people as COVID-19 um, just to get just to funding. funding. But, but let's, let's talk, talk about what it costs what it to go to the hospital. hospital. Uh, if you go to the, you go to the hospital, hospital because you stubbed your toe, your toe and, and are admitted, it's going to be five grand, grand probably. Um, so, so let alone if you go to the doctor with a deadly pathogen that is one of the most transmittable viruses we've seen in decades. So they have to put you in isolation. Uh, they, they have, have a, a huge, huge load, load in, in dealing with, with just one positive case, regardless of the symptoms. Um, so, so I really, really don't think that ten to fifteen thousand dollars is unreasonable for that, for that care system. Our system. And then the next, and then the if next, you have to be have to put be on a ventilator, ventilator and put in the ICU, in the ICU uh, I don't know about, about you, but I don't hear very don't many hear people that end up in the ICU for any reason that don't end up with a hospital bill that's north of thirty thousand dollars at the end of the day if you're put in intensive care. So those those numbers are not inflated above what normal illnesses are, at least not by a huge percentage. Uh, and, the uh, and the complexity and the difficulty of this disease, of this disease I, think I think, would call for that. that. So, so to, try to try and connect it to, to say that the CD, that the doctors are making it up for funding, uh, I really don't think is fair. And I think it's a big leap. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, did you have anything to add to that? No, no but I, I um, thought of another couple of things, things. Yeah. Um, yeah. that's diff different, different with, with, with this virus. virus. The sequela from this virus, when you have a serious case, it seems to be... Um, a, lot a lot worse, worse than, than the influenza. influenza. Usually, Usually when, when you, you when you recover, recover from influenza, influenza, you have very little yeah. sequela, meaning you don't, you don't have, have any long-lasting long problems left over. over. You're, you're, you're usually, usually clear, clear and good to go. go. This, 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 virus, this virus, if you get the serious pneumonia, pneumonia it, can it can cause fibrous, fibrous tissue to form, to form within your lungs and you have basically a fibrosis within your lungs, which reduces your ability to, to, to breathe. And, and that can be lifelong, lifelong lasting lifelong. lifelong. So it's a, it's, it's a serious, serious has, has serious sequela to it than that the influenza, influenza doesn't have. Gotcha. Um, now I'm kind of jumping topics here, but uh, I, I found this particularly interesting. Um, can you tell me and the viewers where the toilet paper shortage originated? How did that come about? Because it, you, which, which I don't think it. Are you pitching that to me? me? Either one, either one. I think I, think I, can, I can handle, handle this, this one. This one isn't about, about science. science. This is markets. Uh, so Scott and I were watching this thing in late January, and when it spread out of Wuhan and started to spread around all of China and they started to lock down China. Um, we saw reports coming out of Singapore and Hong Kong, um, to uh, Tokyo, a lot of the Asian countries of that there were runs on um, goods and in, in their grocery stores. And the main thing that everybody wanted was to toilet paper in those regions because a lot of their toilet paper is made in China and they figured that it would, would have a shortage. So that kind of started this wave that uh, people saw YouTube videos and, and news clips that was gone from shelves in these major cities. And that, that really just spread across the world from there, that you saw it move through, through um, India and through, the, through Europe uh, and then ended up coming here. Uh, so it's not, a lot of people are trying to say, oh, we're, we're so stupid. 
um, is that people are kind of herd creatures. Uh, we see what we're seeing crowds do. Um, so we saw the crowds in Asia buying toilet paper and we started buying it too. And so that's where that came from. Uh, was it a starter supply comes out of China? And so it was, it was a demand thing too. Um, so in, obviously the increase in demand, not necessarily a, a supply problem, but the other important thing is it, you know, people say, well, you're hoarding toilet paper. No, it wasn't hoarding toilet paper. The objective was to, to prepare and get an inventory of toilet paper so you don't have to go out into the stores and mingle with people because you know you don't want to be transmitting or receiving the virus. So you wanted to be able to shelter in place like they're trying to do now. And that was we were way ahead of that, that game. Um, and that was the main objective is to stay away from crowds of people. That was um, one of the main reasons to prepare. Now, I know that we are still experiencing some toilet paper shortages throughout the United States, uh, but we do have our own toilet paper manufacturers here in the States, do we not? Sure, we do. I can't, I can't imagine we, we ship toilet paper from China on, on container ships. <laughs> That's, that doesn't seem very feasible to me. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Uh, we have... We had a family member that worked at a paper mill in Maine for a while, so I know that there's there's plenty of paper production in the United States, and I'm sure that there are there is production here, but it's just a matter of demand is so high right. because once people see empty shelves, when they see it again, they're like, well, I better buy extra, uh, and that's just putting yeah. so much demand on the system that they can't keep up current catch up soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's switch gears and let's talk about the tiger in the Bronx. A tiger tested positive for COVID-19 in a New York zoo. And that really caught my attention. What, Scott, what does that mean? And what can we take away from this? That, uh, that test was actually performed in Ames, Iowa, where in the campus that are, where I work, so in our diagnostic lab. Wow. Yeah. Cause we, we do, we do, um, we do all the animal, testing and confirmation testing in in Ames at the diagnostic virology laboratory so and i that's the campus i worked on i didn't work in the diagnostic lab but i i worked on that campus that's where and in the, in the, under usda um that's an interesting thing um i saw that and i heard i had i'd heard that some cats had um tested positive for the virus um and I thought, well, okay, I can see that. And and then the question is, okay, if they can be infected, can they transmit it? And the interesting thing that's about those cats in the Bronx is that they actually had symptoms. Well, if they had symptoms, that means the virus is replicating pretty well and causing disease. Mm. And and there was there has been some studies showing that they can recover the va the virus from cats. And then, so that makes me very suspicious that, yeah, if they can, if they can uh, be infected by the, the virus, they get disease, meaning that the virus is replicating and they can shed the virus, then obviously they can transmit it to humans. Now, how effectively that is, is, is yet to be determined, but it's a, it's a risk factor that we don't really know how, how severe of a risk factor it is, but that's, that's pretty unique. Most viruses, like I said, they'll stay within their species and they won't jump back and forth quite that easily. So that's, that's a unique thing about this virus. The, the story is yet to be finished on exactly where this virus came from, how it came to be. The, the science isn't solid on it yet. We know that um, it has a heritage in the horseshoe bat. Um, uh, based on studies coming out of China, that bat is not indigenous to Wuhan. And I think the closest uh, group of horseshoe bats is roughly 900 kilometers away. So the likelihood that somebody was eating a horseshoe bat or that a horseshoe bat was in Wuhan um, is fairly low. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the only way that it could happen, but that's one 
hypothesis that I just don't think is very, very reasonable. Um, and there's actually data that is showing that there were disease labs in Wuhan that were doing studies on coronaviruses that descended from horseshoe bats. So I know everybody is trying to say that it's a conspiracy theory that this virus could have come from a lab. Um, and I, we can't say that it did, but we certainly can't say that it didn't. We, we don't know yet. Um, and there's, there, we need to be searching out the evidence in all directions because this virus, the, the spike protein is very unique. Um, and Scott, I don't know if you want to talk about this at all, but the, the spike protein is what allows it to attach to the ACE2 receptor of the cell, um, which is why this is so virulent and why it spreads is, is it, it is able to enter the cell very efficiently. Um, and there are plenty of scientists that have written reports, including uh, from South China in Hong Kong that have studied it and said that um, based on that spike protein, uh, they think that, um, that there are a lot of questions about how it came to be. So something that we should definitely keep our eyes on, not make any assumptions, uh, whether it's natural or whether it was man-made, it doesn't really change anything as far as what we do to try and combat it. Um, but the, I think that the narrative that it was natural and why it's being pushed so hard and why the other conclusion is being suppressed so hard is because if it came from something that is going to be very harmful for the Communist Party in China, and they don't want that to come out. So it's something that uh, we should keep an open mind about, not make assumptions, but uh, definitely keep an open mind about. Do you mind giving a plug to... Uh, not to at all. I am <laughs> very, very impressed with uh, with their journalism, their research, and of course the documentary that uh, Brad sent to me the other day, I did watch that in full. And I will say that that is, that is probably the best account I have seen anywhere on this virus, the origin, the spread, and very specifically the timeline. Um, I, I was very impressed with, with the Epic Times. So, yes, please plug them. Well, that was, yeah, um, I think his name's Joshua Phillips, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the title of that, um, that report, but that documentary. I, but Epic Times has it on their uh, YouTube channel, I think. It's just still up there. <laughs> I, think it's called, I think it's called The Origin of the Wuhan Virus or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. But, but I mean, a hat tip to them. That it was it was well done, very well done. You know, yeah. Well, I think, I your, think your, your, list, your your listeners, your listeners would would, would uh, your, your audience, audience would really uh, enjoy, enjoy watching, watching that. that. And I I, I, I suspect I suspect, I suspect it came from that lab, lab, and I suspect it was an accidental, accidental release. release. I, don't I don't think, think it, was it was intentional, intentional but, but I think, I think it, was it was an accidental, accidental release. release. And, and, well, yeah. one of the things that I really appreciated about the Epoch Times is the lack of bias agenda and politicizing it, it was just very straightforward rather than um tilted or slanted i felt like they didn't yeah. they didn't really have an agenda and and for those of you listening what we're referring to epic times that's that's actually spelled e p o c h epic times like epoch um if you get on youtube type first COVID-19 documentary, Epic Times, in the search bar. That should take you straight to that video. It's just short of an hour, and it is extremely enlightening. I would highly encourage all of you to watch that. Uh, hey, hey, Dane, can, can, you, can, you, can you, you add the link below on your comment section? section? We absolutely you know, can. I probably can't do it right I, now, I, but we can definitely do it after no, the stream. I, after, no, yeah, that's, what that's what I'd recommend, recommend doing. doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me get back to the, uh, the this tiger that tested positive for COVID-19, because in my mind, it raises two major concerns. One being, um, we know the feline family can now contract it. I have a cat. Millions of people have house cats. So could we be looking at another potential carrier contagion you know if we let our pets outside they mingle with someone else or another animal who may have it then they come home we love all over them they run all over the house it just seems to me like it could certainly lead to further spread 
And the other concern is, now we don't know how many species that it can cross over to, but uh, if it were to get into species that we consume on a regular basis, such as cattle, poultry, et cetera, what would that do to our food supply chain? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried, worried about, about our, our food, food, food supply, supply chain. chain. Uh, uh, like I said, these, those have their own coronaviruses. I doubt this one will spread to that many species. They generally like to prefer a specific species, and this one seems to like humans. Uh, I'm really not that worried about the cat problem. I think it, it's a potential issue that we need to keep in mind, but I think the con real concern is human-to-human -human transmission, which, which is most likely to occur. I think human-to-human -human is much more efficient than than a cat to human, or even human to cat. Okay, well that's good news. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I could be I could be proven wrong, wrong but <laughs> that's a, that's, that's, a, that's what I that's what that's I what I suspect. Well, we'll, we'll, see. we'll see. Well, in talking about how it seems to like to jump from human to human, and how it is very uh, resilient and very contagious. Um, can we talk about how long the coronavirus can last on different surfaces, like a doorknob or a tabletop, a countertop, things of that nature? How long can it last on surfaces? Depending on the, Depending the, on conditions, the conditions, obviously, obviously um, room, uh, temperature, room temperature, I think it can, I think can last on a hard, hard surface, surface for days. For days. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. been I've, I've seen, seen reports, reports up to nine, up to nine plus, plus days, days on stainless, on stainless steel, steel or you know smooth smooth surfaces. Um, some of the reports I've seen is cardboard, paper, fabrics um, can last as long as you know one to one to four days, depending on the material and the conditions. Um, so it's definitely a lot more robust than your common flu virus or, or other viruses, um, which tend to not survive more than. 30 minutes to an hour or, or maybe a little bit more, but nine days is very unusual um, for a virus to be able to survive that long. And so, Scott, I mean, what, what this, is your experience there? Sir? This might be a good time to talk about disinfectants. Um, the, 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 the best disinfectant is a 10% solution of bleach. That'll kill any virus. Um, and you have to be careful, obviously, uh, don't use it directly on your skin. It can be corrosive to some some metals, and obviously it can bleach out some fabrics. But on on surfaces uh, that you want to sterilize, uh, the bleach is is the best. Soap and water is very effective at 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 neutralizing and killing this virus. So just washing your hands with plain soap and water is very effective. So soap and water on anything you want to clean and disinfect is there is very helpful. So, and there's a lot of disinfectants out there that work. So thankfully it's not, it's not like some of the parvoviruses, which are hard to, hard to disinfect. This one's relatively, relatively uh, uh, labile or, or susceptible to disinfectant. So long as we're diligent about it on our end. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and I think, I think, I think that the, the social distancing measures that have been put in place, um, six feet, there's, uh, there's a study out of South China that shows that there can be airborne that went on to a bus and sat near the back, uh, um, and they were able to track them the entire trip with, uh, with cameras and saw where they went. Um, and there were people that were positive that sat 14 feet away from them, um, which is just showing that it is in the air uh, and just, you know, keeping a little bit of distance from somebody may not be enough. Hopefully it is, but uh, you should take every one of those circumstances where you get close to another human being uh, very seriously and, and do it as little as possible. And do it as little. Dane, Dane, Dane one thing your audience might be, the infective dose, what, what people probably don't understand is um, they think if you're exposed, well, you, you, you acquire an infective dose and you get it. That infective dose can vary, meaning if you get a light, there's, there's actually a minimum of infective dose, meaning that you might get one virus particle 
or a few virus particles exposed to it and you don't get the infection. There is actually a, a set number of infective particles that you have to have to become infected. They call it a minimum infective dose. So if you get a minimum infective dose, generally you'll have a mild disease. So that that will that will lend to a, a milder outcome. If you get a high infective dose, so you're exposed to a high, somebody very contagious, very sick, spewing out a lot of virus, <clears throat> you get a high infective dose, most likely you're going to have a severe disease because the infective dose matters. Now, the other thing is time. You may, you may be exposed once or you may be exposed several times in a short period of time, several times. That will increase your infective dose could lead to a, a, a more severe disease. So it's, it's always a good idea to avoid exposure and minimize that infective dose. That's why things like masks work and social distancing things so, work. So uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're, most, you're, most people don't understand that, that thing, thing about infective, infective doses and, and, and how, how that can vary. vary. Well, and I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned um, masks you know, uh, here in the Branson community, we are trying to abide by the stay-at-home orders as much as possible. Obviously, occasionally we have to go out and get uh, basic household supplies, food, etc. When we go out, I am alarmed at the amount of people that are within very close quarters, not practicing social distancing, and they have no protection whatsoever. No gloves, no masks. And now I understand that it is important to have N95 masks and surgical masks readily available for our healthcare workers who are on the front lines day in and day out. But could we not be using, and should we not be using fabric masks to at least keep the spread of the droplets down? Well, any, well, mask, any is mask is better than no mask. Better than no mask. Uh, like I said, if it can reduce the infective dose, it, it will help. Um, obviously, the N95s are ideal because they're they're um, effective enough that they can virus pretty effectively. Um, but yeah, the the whole idea about masks has been quite controversial. Even our Surgeon General said they they weren't effective, they weren't effective, and they that we shouldn't use them. And that you know, when when we're dealing with a crisis like a pandemic. Our leadership needs to be transparent and honest to us. They, they don't, you know, if they would have just said, you know, hey, we're short, we we our supplies are short, the, our medical staff needs them, we would have understood that. But don't lie to us and say they don't work. It's obvious they do. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's very important. Um, so we've talked about the nature of the virus. We've talked about the origins. We've talked about some some key points. Um, and, and some of it has been a rather bleak outlook, but let's talk about hydroxychloroquine <laughs> because this seems to be uh, a big ray of hope in our current situation, but I can't figure out for the life of me why it's being politicized so heavily. This is a, this is a treatment that we've been using for decades that we know is safe that we prescribe to pregnant women and children. Um, why, why, is this such an, why is this such an issue right now? Well, well um, rather than dwell, rather than dwell on the dwell issue right now, as far as political, let, let me just say that if this was a new drug that just came out, it would be the hottest thing. But since it's an old drug that's been out there for 65 years, and now it's politicized. Um, it's 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 really exposes the fragility of, of some people on the political spectrum. And you know, I, I guess I'd like to go back and just say, if this drug was new, <clears throat> the unique thing about hydroxychloroquine, it is for mitigation. It's it it inhibits the virus's ability to replicate, which is very important, obviously, Absolutely. because that replication triggers inflammation and causes disease. And two, 
it actually mitigates the immune system and suppresses and controls the inflammation from getting out of hand. So it's the perfect drug for this disease It because it does the two things you need. Stop the virus from replicating and control the inflammation. And it's like a miracle. And, and you know, from my perspective, it's a game changer. And kind of like the president said, um, you know, it is a game changer. It's huge. Unfortunately, we don't make it in the United States anymore. And the, su the supply has been an issue. Not, not to mention it, it, be it became um, a beach ball in, in a political game. And then that's just that's just been sad. Uh, even even in medicine, you know, there's people even in medicine that don't know what they're talking about because they haven't used hydroxychloroquine in their practice. You know, people that have used it that are reporting that this thing is extremely safe when it can be used in children, pregnant women, nursing women. Come on. It, this is one of the most it's so it's safe. It's effective and it's cheap. So. Where's the disconnect, right? Well, well as, as, as Trump, Trump says, says it's, it's like, like, you know, what do you have to lose? You know, it's, safe, safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's cheap, cheap and, and in my opinion, my opinion it's, it's very effective, effective and it makes, and it makes, it makes all kinds of sense. It's, 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 in my opinion, my opinion it's, it's the drug, the drug of, choice of choice because it does two things. It inhibits the virus and it, it controls the, inf the inflammation, which causes the disease. The, other, the thing about it, unfortunately, is we're not using it correctly. We're, we're using it... When, when seri cases, cases are serious, serious. We, we need to use, use it early, early right, right away, away. Almost, almost like a prophylactic or preventative. Or preventative. I was hoping that you would, would say that. Can you can you explain yeah. to the viewers what a prophylactic is? Yeah, yeah prophylactic, prophylactic is like a vaccine because it prevents disease. That's what vaccines do. A prophylactic is a therapeutic. It's not a vaccine, but it can it can keep you from getting the disease. So it prevents prophylactic and prevent kind of the same. Synonym. Then, so it prevents you from getting the disease, but it may allow the infection to occur just enough that you have an immune response. So, so the, thing the thing I really, I really kind of go down a rabbit, rabbit hole, hole is, is, is my theory, my theory would, would, be, would be we should let we should let, we should we let, this, let virus, this virus. Uh, you know, in you livestock, know, in sometimes, sometimes when we don't have, we a, don't vaccine, have a vaccine. And in, and in coronavirus in pigs, in pigs called, called there's a, there's a, there's a disease, disease called, T called TGE. It's transmissible gastroenteritis. Before we had a vaccine, which the vaccines may or may not be very good, but before we had a vaccine, we would do a controlled exposures. We had intentionally exposed the pigs to the virus at, at a time when they can handle it. And then it would reduce the disease later because they pass on immunity. So... In this case, in this outbreak, you know, I would propose considering controlled exposure, meaning that allow people to mingle, to be social, but hand out hydroxychloroquine like candy and, and let people have it freely to treat early or pr as a pro prophylactic and let this virus spread throughout our population without causing disease and and all the economic that it's causing. I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. Let me, let me do a quick recap back to you to make sure I've got this right. But basically what you're saying is um, if, if we were to give this out, hydroxychloroquine, on a massive scale, um, and, and due to the nature of this drug, it could actually allow you to have somewhat of an immune response. So what would end up happening is we would develop an immunity while taking this. Everybody gets exposed to it, and then our bodies are no longer naive, as you've mentioned before. Correct, correct. Is that what you're getting Perfect, at? perfect. Perfect, okay, perfect. Yep. Yep. That's exactly, that's exactly, that's exactly, that's what, exactly I'm what I'm getting at. Because see, the, 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 the hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine will, not, will stop, not stop the infection. You'll still get infected. However, it will be a mild infection, just like a vaccine, there there are modified live right. vaccines that cause infection. Yep, they cause infections, yeah. but they but they're mild and they're not virulent. A, well, they call them avirulent, meaning they don't cause disease. Well, in this case, you'll get infected. The hydroxychloroquine will will prevent the disease from occurring, but you'll still be infected, and hopefully produce an immune response, which then will make you immune 
to the virus without disease. disease. That makes perfect sense to me. I would love to see that start happening. I think yeah, the one yeah, interesting thing, thing would be if they could find a way to uh, definitely start giving it to all the frontline workers and hospitals. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anybody who has close contact with patients should be on it for sure. Um, and then I would think we may look at people who are immune compromised at maybe giving them doses first um, and then working your way down to the general public. Because I think if we just handed it out, we couldn't keep up. But if we just did our our healthcare professionals and those who are immunocompromised and those who are experiencing severe symptoms, um, that might be something that's manageable. Um, but again, that's just conjecture. I'm, I'm no expert, but that would certainly seem like a possibility that would be a whole lot better than shutting down the entire world economy right. and everybody you know, sitting in their house for six months and hoping this goes away right. when we we're seeing really good information and data coming from doctors who are using this right now. Right now. But, I but I agree. I agree, agree about, about the, the, the frontline, frontline medical, medical staff. staff. That is that critical is. because that's the whole reason we're, we're, um, we're trying to quarantine and slow everything down is because our medical communities would, would be uh, overwhelmed and not be able to handle all the cases and severe cases. And the death rates would be uh, much worse than, than what they are right now. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with that completely get the frontline staff. And I think there's some studies that are actually looking at hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic. Um, the other thing in a free culture like ours, what I think would be uh, nice to do is give people the option, say, okay, if, if you want to mingle, if you want to be social, you want to get out and, and be in crowds of people, here's hydroxychloroquine is available to you. If you choose not to take it for whatever reason, if you're worried about safety or, or whatever, and you don't want to, then you, you can voluntarily quarantine yourself or stay stay in it. But if you don't, you'll end up being exposed and having the disease. Now that's a free culture. You can you can choose what you want to do. Um, but then again, if you do come down sick, the medical community needs to understand that you need to be treated right away, not not wait. A lot of hydroxychloroquine uh, in inventory, and unfortunately, we don't make it anymore. We used to make there was a Milan, I think, is the name of the company in, in West Virginia that used to make 80% of it for the world. And they're, they're trying to ramp back up. But, um, yeah, we, we uh, safe, cheap, and effective. effective. It's, I, think, I think one it's of the things you just brought, you just brought up, brought Scott, up. Scott, is how we, we are a free country. And being a, a red-blooded American libertarian, uh, I have – a lot of difficulty with some of these draconian measures um, and with some of these demands and things being placed upon us. And I can empathize with the people that are saying, well, if the government demands I can't do this, then I should do it. Uh, and in many cases, you would be right. But in this particular case, um, by defying what we're being told and by defying the data uh, and making assumptions about what you think is going to happen, you're, you're not only putting your own life at risk, but you're putting others. Uh, and I heard a guy say the other day that, that uh, we have, have rights, but with those rights come responsibility. Yes. Um, and yes, you have the right to go out and do these things, but you also need to be responsible for, for your own helpers. Um, so it is important to look at the data, uh, see what's going on, and understand the difference between uh, uh, understand, uh, math understand math and how this, and thing, how is this thing is grown, um, grown um, and how and these, how comparisons, these to comparisons to the flu, to the flu early, early on, on uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Drew really, really pushed that, 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 where he was saying, oh, the flu is much worse, worse. way more people are infected with the flu. Uh, just recently, uh, just in the last week and a half or so, Dr. Drew, and i got to give him a lot of credit, he apologized, and he said he was wrong, and he said, this isn't the flu, and he said, this is much more serious, and we do need to be taking these actions. Um, um, so I think so it's I think important, important to look, to look at a guy, at guy like that, that who made, who a, made very a very public, public stance, stance that, this that this was not, not as bad as the as flu, flu and he has he changed his mind. Uh, and, uh, to and to understand, understand that the data, the data is what, what helped, helped him see that. See that. Um, um, yeah, because we're, we're, what are we at? We're, I think I went this morning and I think we're at 1.6 million cases around the world and over 100,000 deaths. So this is this is very serious. And with each new case, you have, if an RO is call it two to four um, yeah, yeah and then we're, we're still, still just in the starting, starting phase of it when you 
think about it because uh, if it's going to be spreading for another year, year and a half, um, how many people are immune to it right now? Very few. Very few people are immune to this. We're majority of us are naive to it. Still. And I'm, I'm seeing a very interesting phenomenon, like that these things come in waves and whether it's the Spanish flu or any of these viruses that come out, there's a wave pattern to how it goes through uh, the species. And I feel like we're reaching a little bit of a peak of the first wave here um, that a lot of these measures of social distancing are going to bring that initial peak down. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the president wanting to reopen things by May 1st. So I think people are going to start coming out. But the overall percentage of the American public that is actually immune to this, I still feel is fairly low. So we may come back out and start intermingling again and then have a second wave. Um, and we may see this kind of a, uh, in and out of uh, staying home for several months. I don't know if you guys... Um watch the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, but um, he recently had a guest on there that said something that was pretty succinct, but I thought it was uh, good at putting things in perspective. And basically what he said is a lot of people think that right now we're looking at a coronavirus blizzard, but the reality is we're looking at a coronavirus winter. In other words, this is not just a heavy, short blast. This is going to be with us for a while. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, good that's a good analogy. That's, that's, that's right. That's, right. And that's, yeah, a, great that's a great episode. episode. I forget the doctor's name, but uh, that, guy, is, that was, a great, that that was a great episode. Is that the guy from that Minnesota? The, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, good. He's good. Uh, yeah. And, you know, while we're on the topic of information sources, um, Scott, given your, your history and your experience with viruses, vaccines, diseases, inflammation, um, what, what, what sources would you recommend people go to uh, for accurate information and to stay up to date and informed <laughs> without so much bias and spin, if it's possible? Well, I mean, we've mentioned the Epic Times, but, you know, what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a good, good source. source. Um, I'd, I'd stay, stay away, away from, from mainstream, mainstream media, media, that's, that's for sure. sure. Uh, I, yeah. yeah. I, tell I tell you, you know, Fox has, has been somewhat balanced. balanced. Um, uh, Tucker Carlson has done a great job. job. I've, I've, I've I probably appreciate his, 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 um, his, his work, work and reporting probably, probably as good, good as anybody, anybody on Fox. He's been good. Um, Laura Ingram has done a pretty good job. She she really worked hard and promoted uh, the hydroxychloroquine, which I thought was yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. And Dr. Oz has been doing a great job promoting yeah, that, too, by the, by the way. way. I've, I've, I've really been, been happy to see. To see. I've always, always kind of liked Dr. Dr. Oz. He's, he's been, been, he's been open-minded and reasonable and, 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 and look at, all, at, at, at alternative uh, treatments, treatments to things. And, things. and he's, he's been, been I've been impressed with him. And this this really, I'm really happy to see him, him take, take take the, the stand, stand that he has, has right, right now with with, with the, the, the therapies, therapies the, the potential, potential therapies, therapies for this um, this virus. virus. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, obviously, obviously, with my, with my background, background, I can I look at scientific, at scientific um, reports, reports and studies and, and, and actually be able to read them, kind of understand what they mean. Right. So I look at a lot of alternative sources of information. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't even listen to mainstream media. I don't trust anything comes out of there anyway. Well, I mean, just look at how they've they've. The, the hydroxychloroquine they thing, making that, that political, political that, I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous. ridiculous. You know, you know we're, we're, we're in the middle of a crisis and you're taking a, a very promising therapy and, and using it as a, as a political ploy. Uh, it's, it's pretty sad. So that's a whole, that's a whole discussion in itself. Well, and you know, that's one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing right now. Um, do we have the audience of CNN or ABC? No, we do not. But, you know, I feel it's like I feel that it's every citizen's duty uh, within their community to if they see a need to fill that need. And one of the things that we saw here was just so much misinformation, so much conjecture, so many rumors. And, you know, it just people get in a panic and it's just chaos. And we didn't want to see that. So 
you know, do we have millions of viewers? Not yet. Um, <laughs> but I still wanted to do everything. We still wanted to do everything that we could to try and help educate our community, keep them informed, and give them the information without the bias without the spin, without the politics. So again, and, and I really appreciate you guys coming on here and doing this. And I think, and I think uh, Scott, uh, Scott, you, you would agree uh, too that multiple sources of information um, where you, you can't just pick one. Um, I, my YouTube video feed is very colorful now where I get, uh, I get video from the Japanese news to um, India to Italy and the UK and then the US. So you really kind of have to take a conglomerate or, or a collaborative view of all the different media and all the different sources in order to get an accurate view of what's going on. You can't just listen to one source. And, and, yeah, and yeah, at the end of the day, you have to use your own, you have to use your own logic. You have to think, you have to look at it. You have to say, well, I know this, um, you know, I know that, and one of my favorite guys, Taleb, Scott and I are big fans of Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan and Nancy Fragile. But in those books, he talks about how negative knowledge is more robust, where it's better knowledge to know what you shouldn't do versus what you should. So we can look around and based off what has happened around the world, we, we know, know that, that we should we, we shouldn't be in large of people. Um, we going, going out to eat. We shouldn't, shouldn't be doing a lot of these things, things uh, that, that spread, spread the disease. disease. So, so we can we can, we can we develop can very robust knowledge from the negative side by looking at the history of this virus, how other countries have uh, contracted it, and had it run through their through their countries, and that can really help give us some guidance. We're very blessed in the United States. Uh, that this hit here last, really. It started in Asia and really worked and its really way across its way to Europe and then to here. Um, um, we and we are extremely lucky that it didn't, that it go, didn't from go from China, China to here first, to here first uh, because, uh, because we, we, I think the story would be much different, be much different if it would have gone, gone that direction. direction. Yeah, we can yeah, give, we can give kudos, kudos to Trump for that, for that, that, that ban, ban of travel. travel, and that helped. That did give us some time. Yeah, Yeah, and I mean, he took a lot of heat on that, but I'm glad that he did it. Because oh, it, yeah. it could have it, totally it, changed the narrative of where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. And, I and I think that's, that's the, the one, one move, move that really, really made, made up, up for, for a lot, lot of other mistakes that he made. Uh, you know, I think early on Trump didn't understand how serious this was. He wasn't taking it as seriously as he should. But that one single move of shutting off China, I think, saved tens of thousands of lives in the United States because it allowed it to come here last instead of second. Yeah. Yeah. And going back, and you know, you want. Go corroborate what together confidence in what you're you're hearing. Once, you know, it hit my radar. I'm like, okay, pay attention to this. And here, when we started talking about preparation, it wasn't like, okay, so we're going to prepare for the pandemic. No, we didn't do that. It was it was prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. So it was just logical, reasonable preparation over time and we fortunately saw it early and and had the ability to to brace ourselves and and prepare for it over that l length of time and and as that time unfolded the story became it, on that spectrum of hope for the best and or prepare for the best and or prepare for the worst and hope for the best it it, it became the worst case scenario it unfolded as a pan yeah. pandemic and uh, it undecided to that. <laughs> so, so that's another topic that's another topic <laughs> uh brad do you want to speak to that <laughs> well uh, yeah we can't whether it's the who um even some of our government agencies like the cdc and the fda that they're not perfect they're bureaucracies obviously the ccp being the worst among them um, but it, it's so frustrating that on youtube that every single thing that pops up about uh, coronavirus there's a who banner ad right below every single video that talks about it that the the mainstream is really pushing these 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 establishment uh figures that have a history a recent history of lying to us um and we need to just kind of take that history into consideration and, and do our own research and make up our own minds and and let me let me interject here for just a second um just for the sake of clarity, can you define these acronyms for our audience? So the WHO, the CDC, and uh, very importantly, the CCP. What, what are those organizations? 
Oh, so the oh, CCP, so the CCP is, uh, is the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. Communist Party. Uh, uh, the, WHO the WHO is the World Health World Organization, Organization, which gets which roughly 30%, 30 I believe, of their, believe of their financing from the Communist, the Communist Party. Party. Um, um, and for some reason, for some they, reason just they just seem to have, to have a very strong loyalty, loyalty to, the to the Communist Party. Party. Uh, if, you uh, if you want something fun, something look fun, up some of the early... Media, media blast, blast from, Tedros from Tedros and the WHO, and, the WHO. and, and all, they all they did early on, on was praise China's, China's response, and, and we are so grateful, we are so grateful for China. China. So they, they, they were a mouthpiece for the, the, the Communist Party, Party very early. Very early. Uh, the, CDC, uh, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, yeah, all of these... All these, all these uh, acronyms, acronyms are just these are just giant, giant bureaucracies, bureaucracies and, and uh, oh, we, we, our, post our post office, office can't, can't run efficiently. Run efficiently. Um, um, how, how, how are we are going, we to, going trust to trust somebody, somebody to, protect to protect every, every American, American from, from a novel, novel virus, virus and give us, give us timely, timely and accurate, accurate information? information. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, well, with this, with this. yeah, let, yeah let's, let's just briefly talk about the, the, the WHO went to China, came back and said, Oh, there's no human to human transmission. I mean, a blatant lie. They 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 take Chinese information and and lie to the world about the human to human transmission. And that was in was that late in December or no, that was that in was, January. That was late late in January, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Late in January. So at that time, if the world would have known that this was human to human transmission, it would have really got on everybody's radar and action would have started right away. But it was several weeks after that before the authorities realized it was actually being transmitted human to human. And I think and, and then when China took the action to, to, to ban Wuhan and, and uh, lock them down, basically. The, you know, here's the interesting thing is these institutions performed extremely poorly in this crisis of a pandemic. The WHO, our CDC, the testing, that was a disaster. Our FDA and, and the testing part and also therapeutics, a disaster. Institutions don't handle crisis the crisis as well, as well and, and, don't and don't perform, perform well. well. Who, does? Who does? The private, the private sector. sector. The private, the private sector. sector. The companies, the companies in the medical the communities, communities our, our, our doctors, doctors, our hospitals, our hospitals the, 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 the private, private sector, sector, the people, the people in, Main in Main Street, Street perform, perform exceedingly, exceedingly well. well. Our, government our government institutions and our international our institutions, institutions failed, failed miserably. miserably. Absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, Scott, can I get you to do me a quick favor? Could you tilt your camera up just a little bit? I'm cutting off part of your head. Yep, yep. There okay, we go. Okay. That's better. Excellent. Thank you. Get, 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 my, get, my, get my good get my side. side. And, well, let's get your hat, too, because <laughs> I believe you're uh, repping a brand there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, this is this our, is our uh, uh, we have an, we outfitter, have an outfitter business, business in, Southern in Southern Iowa, Iowa Oxbow Ridge Outfitters Ridge. Outfitters.com. So I'll plug, so I'll to, plug my to my business. What uh, yeah, what yeah. do you guys do there? We have we have world class, class whitetail white hunting, hunting and turkey hunting, turkey hunting in, in, uh, in uh, southern, southern Iowa. Iowa. Yep. yep. So Brad and I are going to come visit you soon, right? Well, when this is hey, all behind hey. us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's good. You, can, you can social uh, distance well, well in a tree stand. It's, hey, it's, it's easy to social. It's, I'm at camp, I'm at camp right, right now. now. It's our hunting camp, and it's easy to social distance here. There's nobody around. I noticed some my son. Notice some of the mounts in the background. That's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, hey, Dane, do you, you have any, any, any questions from, from the audience, audience that they've submitted? Yes, we do, actually. The, um, I've got a few of them here so far. Uh, so the first question uh, says, I am a 21-year-old male. I live in the Midwest, and I have never been vaccinated. With everything currently going on in the world, should I look at getting immunized, vaccinated, et cetera? Well, well it depends, depends on, on what, what he's vaccinating, vaccinating for. for. I mean, I mean that's, that's a that's a big that's, that's a question. question. I, I don't, he's, he's not being, being specific. Um, you, you know, know if, if for example, if he's, if he's going to be exposed to a rabid dog, dog, you want to be you want to be vaccinated, vaccinated for rabies. If, if you're, you're going, going to be exposed to tetanus, tetanus, tetanus is one. You, yes, you should always be exposed to or vaccinated for. So it depends on what he what agent. Because all, all these eight, all vaccines are specific, are specific for a specific pathogen. pathogen. Sure. Right. right. Um, yeah. We also have Faye Schubert from Hollister, Missouri. She asks, 
do you think that the virus has been circulating in the U.S. since before January? Or do you think it came after? Scott, Scott can I take, I take a crack, crack at this one? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So there's a study that was done in, in out of South China, out of Hong Kong, where as a part of tracing the genome or mapping the genome, um, they were able to look at cases from all over China uh, and all over the region. And what they found was that those viruses were all very similar, that there was very little difference between the viruses, um, which that showed that the amount of time that the virus had been circulating um, within our species has been fairly short. And they estimate that the virus entered human beings between October 30th and November 29th of 2019, which if you look at the, the progression through China uh, through November, December, the math adds up if you look at the doubling rate of four to six days for doubling. So um, I, I think that that study is extremely strong. And my personal opinion is, Scott, you can give yours, but my opinion is no, I don't think that we saw any cases in the U.S. until maybe late December, early January would, would be the absolute earliest. And that would probably require somebody to have traveled to China um, or be exposed to somebody who had. Yeah. Yeah, it was in that in that uh, Epic Times and some of the other information, like in the they they had the, the index case, which means the first person infected, index case. Didn't they think that was in early December, like like when they had, when they the, had the index, index case. case? So that, so that should, should be, be the, the first, first person, person infected. infected. And I thought, and they, I thought they said, said it, was it was early December. December. Well, and also well, you can also look at a lot of the whistleblowers in China, a lot of the doctors that were blowing the whistle on yes. when they yeah. began to see yeah. cases. Yes. And they were and they very specific, specific about when they, when they were seeing this, seeing this new type of, type of SARS-like SARS -like illness, illness circulating, circulating through, through their people, people right there in Wuhan. Wuhan. Um, so, so we know that it came from Wuhan. We know that it's they started seeing cases in December that were coming into the hospital. And then with the genome tracing that's saying that it started in uh, uh, sometime, sometime in November, November, you know, October 30, 30 to November 29. 29 uh, I, think I think we can, can be, be pretty confident that there, there weren't any cases, cases in the United States, States prior to, to, to that, that time, time for, for sure. sure. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, this is great. We actually have several questions lined up. Um, so my co-host, Ginger Michaud, could not join us this evening, uh, but I'm proud of her because she is practicing social distancing. Uh, but she asks, are patients who have contracted it and have recovered, are they now immune? And furthermore, could they continue to infect others after recovery? In, In general, general, I would say, say yeah, yeah, they're, they're immune. immune. Um, there's, 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 we're starting to learn, we're getting information, I should say, that that the immunity may may be full or may not be full. May, there may be immunity in some cases, probably most cases. There are some cases that appear that people may not be immune to it. The other thing that may be happening, which could look like it's n they're not immune, that this virus may be infecting specific cells like macrophages that are immune cells within the body. And they may just be residing there and hibernating and waiting to waiting to grow again and reinfect at a later date for whatever reason. We we see this in some viruses like um, uh, like measles, isn't it? Measles, oh chickenpox. I'm, I'm sorry, chickenpox. You can get shingles. From, that's, oh, that's a virus. Yeah. That's a virus. That's a virus that re reinfects and comes. It's, it's what we call latent. What we call latent. Sits in the, sits body, in the body latent, latent and, then and then reemerges at a specific, specific si time, 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 maybe due maybe to stress, due to stress or, something or something else. else. So, so I, we're, I, not, we're not. This virus. This virus I'm not sure, I'm not if, sure if, it, if, if if somebody gets somebody immune to it, if it completely, completely clears, clears the body, body or, not. or not. We're having we're some having issues with testing too, because some people will test, test negative, and it looks like they've recovered, and then they'll test positive again later. So, is it a testing issue? Is it a testing issue, or is it that latent virus reemerging again? There's there's a lot about this virus, this novel new virus we don't know about, and that's concerning if that's the case. That's, that's not the not flu. The flu, the flu does, does not do that. Do that. 
Once you're immune Once you're to immune the, to you've, the had a, you've had a, a flu, a flu it, clears it clears and you're and done, you're with, done it. with it. This thing, this if it lingers, it lingers and goes latent, latent that's another, that's big, another issue big issue that we have to, that we deal, have to deal, with. deal with. And I think this is something where our, I think our CDC and some of our are not taking enough precaution with people who have quote unquote recovered, where they're saying, I believe if you've been symptom free for uh, seven days or fever free for three days, that they're saying that it's okay to go home and be around people. Um, and I guess I would, I'm no doctor, obviously, but I think we should be certainly be cautious based on some of the data we're seeing come out with people who are either getting a false negative and still positive when they go home or did test negative and then had it reemerge. We just don't know enough about it yet. Yeah. Well, we could also, we could also talk about a different type of therapy. They call, they, they use plasma. You've heard about the, the passive immunity where they use. So somebody that's convalescent, which means, means they've covered and they have antibody in their serum because they have an immune response. So they transfer that serum into another infected person that's, that's battling the disease and those antibodies will neutralize the virus and, and help treat them. Well, that's not completely safe either because there's potentials for ser serum sickness. There's, there's other viruses that can be in serum. Yeah, they'll probably test for those for the most fleet uh, assurance. There's other type of reactions you can have to serum. So serum Transferring serum is not absolutely safe. And, and, you know, they've been complaining about the safety of hydroxychloroquine, which has been prescribed billions of times. Uh, I would say that's more safe than using serum uh, and plasma trans transfer. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, hydroxychloroquine again, because we do have another question on that specifically. Uh, Terry Fensterman asks, how long would people have to take this medicine um, to prevent contracting COVID-19. That would, that would, that all depends, depend that all depends on, on when you're exposed to it. Um, if you know you're being exposed to it, you can take it simultaneously and you'll most likely be infected. And, um, I would say the treatment at that point could be, um, a week or two. They, they treat right now, I think, is only five days, but that's when you know you're infected. Uh, if you're just exposed, you don't know exactly. The incubation period could be probably, what, somewhere around a week to, to 11, 14 days, somewhere in there. So you don't know for sure when the virus actually starts replicating at that time. So you'll, you'll need to be treated prophylactically, prophylactically for a longer period of time than if you actually had the disease and symptoms. Gotcha. Uh, we've got another question here. Norway has reported the RNA strand found in septic systems. Is that rare or normal for coronaviruses? In other words, is this cause for alarm? Well, well it, it, it corroborates what we said, that it infects the GI system causing diarrhea and can be shed in 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 the septic systems that way. So yeah, that's, that's expected. If it makes perfect sense. If it's then. causing GI. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and there was, there was a case that was, was in either Beijing. Uh, it was an apartment complex that they evacuated. Um, this would have been probably in early February because they were concerned that the virus was spreading through the, uh, the sewer pipes through the complex. So there's, there's been instances documented where that has been a concern, um, yeah, and I would definitely say it's, it's, it's highly possible, if not likely, that yes, it, it could be found, found there. Yeah. Um, okay, this, this is interesting. Um, there was, and I hope I'm getting this right, but there was a, uh, a particular group or, or family, some sort of tribal type clan of people uh, back really a hundred years ago during the Spanish influenza epidemic uh, where they were treating all these people and they weren't getting sick. And one of the things that they found that was synonymous across all of these people that were treating infected but were not getting it is that they drank uh, tonic water and took zinc on a daily basis. 
And so we've got a question mm. here that asks, uh, is there validity to that? Is, does, does tonic water and zinc work? Is that helpful? You want me to handle that one? Okay. Yeah. Um, so hydroxychloroquine works by, it's, it's called an ionophore. So what it does is zinc cannot get inside of our cells. It, it has a hard time getting inside of our cells. So it, it, the cell membrane that's around our, our, all of our cells that, that encapsulate our cells, zinc can't cross that very well. Hydroxychloroquine is like a channel. It's called an ionophore. So it, it's like a, uh, oh, like a ditch culvert, if you want to think about it that way. So it opens the door across that membrane and allows zinc to come in. Now, zinc's very important inside the cell because that's where the virus tries to replicate. The virus produces a, an enzyme that, that's part of the replication. And that zinc uh, mineral will actually inhibit that. So it inhibits the, the virus's ability to replicate. And also, the zinc, I talked about how it can produce, uh, mitigate the, the immune response and lower inflammation. And that's, it also does that within the cell. It, it has a, a, the ability to downregulate inflammation. And it does that in a complex way that's kind of beyond the scope of this. But, but zinc does both of those things inside the cell. Stops the replication of the virus and also um, pr reduces and mitigates the inflammation that's causing the disease, like pneumonia or, or, or gastroenteritis and, and things, things like that. that. And, and I, I think, think they're, they're talking, talking about quinine, quinine is the, the tonic substance water. that's in tonic water. Scott, what yeah. do you think about that? Is there any validity not, to that? I'm not, to that? I, I'm, I don't know. I just know hydroxychloroquine is much safer and much more effective. So I would not recommend using the tonic water and zinc. I'd recommend, for this case, it's too serious, jump right to the hydroxychloroquine oh. and, and, and zinc. Yeah. 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 So I guess I would, I would actually say, go ahead. I'd actually, I'd actually say that the, the, the combination of the hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromycin seems to be the most effective. effective. Okay. Uh, now, from, from the from from, from, from what, what I've read. read. Now I I have a question of my own. You you had mentioned that we used to produce hydroxychloroquine here. We don't really do that anymore. So there's a shortage of it. When when or how could we expect to get a hold of this drug just as a everyday citizen just a member of the general public. <laughs> good, good luck trying to get, a, get, get, your, get your hands, hands on that, on that i think it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a commodity, commodity that's that's, that's, cheap, that's cheap safe, safe and effective, and effective however, however you, you can't get your hands, hands on it yeah it's, yeah, very, it's very high, high demand. demand yeah so, yeah. I, so think, I think i've dived I've, I've, I've pretty close trump just had a uh negotiation with modi the president of india and was successful in, in getting them to drop their moratorium on exporting hydrochloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. So I think we are going to continue to get supply out of India. Um, and I think, Scott, we've talked before, doesn't Bayer have plants in Germany that produce it? Um, yeah. that's, so actually, there's, that's actually chloroquine, which is, which is not as safe and effective as hydroxychloroquine. But, yeah, it works. It's just... Um, the let's see santa fe in in switzerland also is a company there are several companies out there that that make it china's not the china doesn't have the corner on that market but it's unfortunate but it's unfortunate that we don't make our make own. our own well as it and correct me if i'm wrong but i think at this point china manufactures over 90 percent of all of our pharmaceuticals is that right thanks thanks bill, bill clinton, clinton. <laughs> So, yeah, so that, am I right that, there? That, 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 all go, that, that all goes back to Bill Clinton. Clinton. Yeah. 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 He, signed, he, signed, he, signed he signed off on that. that. Well, the world, the world trade, trade, the world trade, trade and free trade allowed, allowed China, China to come in, in and, and uh, do, that, do that, basically. basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then, Brad, weren't you saying even if the drug was not necessarily, I don't know what the right word for this would be, but manufactured right there in China, the elements that it takes, the elements that make up these pharmaceuticals are still manufactured in China. Well, they, Am I getting they call that, that right? Raw, they call that raw, they call, yeah, they call, they call those yeah, raw, raw materials. Okay. Yeah. So 
Yeah, China, China, has, a major, China has a major major corner major on the raw materials, the raw materials and that goes all the way down, even the basic down, antibiotics, antibiotics and other and pharmaceuticals, and other pharmaceuticals that we really rely on. Rely on um, that um, you know, that, it's yeah, really the it's equivalent, really equivalent of, of if the if U.S. The US Army, Army exported, exported all of our ammunition, ammunition production, production to China. Uh, every, everybody would freak That's out but say, "What well, crazy?" crazy. Uh, but we uh, but we everybody. public so it really is dangerous and we need to bring it back cost all our pharmaceuticals basically to china i mean our we don't even make aspirin anymore and and our vitamin what was it vitamin c or d or something simple like that even went over there so we don't make anything yeah that was ridiculous that was ridiculous so i would like to now for you guys for all of the viewers watching this is me offering up an opinion, conjecture, whatever you want to call it. This is not gospel, but I would like to think that after such a catastrophic, catastrophic event such as this, that we as a country would learn a lesson from it and start uh, being more self-sufficient, self-reliant, uh, bringing manufacturing back here to the States, uh, especially with items so critical like our pharmaceuticals. Uh, do you see any indicators of maybe us waking up a little bit and that happening in the future? Well, I saw some today. I saw, some I saw today. Japan, I saw... Um, Abe, is actually paying for Japanese companies to leave China and, and actually told them, go anywhere but China and we will pay for you to move. Um, wow. So Japan has started that. And uh, I believe we'll likely see tax credits and things be put in place by our federal government to help bring production and manufacturing back to the U.S. Yeah, um, yeah. That, 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 that will that definitely will be a part of this. And this is, there were, I've there said this early on, that, early on that, uh, it'll put a whole uh, new put a whole meaning new to the term BC. The term BC. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll think of we'll BC think as BC before is Corona, before corona. Um, that the world um, will the never world be the same and the world economy, the way that we see health, the way that we see social interaction, just like the depression Depression really marked really an entire, marked generation. entire generation. This is going to this do the same for all of us that are living through this. Through this. Uh, and, so uh, and so hopefully we do see some changes because there's a lot of fragility in our systems that this has shown. And uh, I'm optimistic uh, that, uh, that we'll do something we'll about, do something about it, it for the future. For the future. Yeah, the, yeah, I, think the, the I think the international community, community uh, has seen, this has really exposed China for what they really are, the Chinese government the government, communist the government communist it really government. has exposed, really has exposed um, uh, who and what they are and, what they are. and, and the, the, world, the, the world the world is going to respond it's going to it's going to take that globalism idea and nationalism is going to replace it people are going to bring back um, the essential things that they need within their own nations or allies and the world's going to be a lot better place for that well, and I, I like that you brought up the importance of uh, nationalism instead of globalism because I'm sure both of you have noticed that we're seeing a one world currency being proposed uh, here and there <laughs> in light of recent events, which I'm not a big fan of that, but what do you guys make of it? <laughs> well, I, we've, I, we've, that talk has been going around for a long time, whether it's the SDR uh, that the World Bank, has, the IMF has put out. And um, there's all kinds of ploys uh, to try and uh, bring about currency change. Uh, from what I understand about economics, though, the bond market is really the most important thing for the strength and, and security of a currency. And the U.S. bond market is the deepest and most liquid bond market in the world, uh, which is why the U.S. Uh, dollar is still the reserve currency. Um, a lot of people think it's because of the petrodollar and all that, but it actually has a lot more to do with the depth of our bond market and the strength um, there. So as long as our bonds are strong, I don't think we're going to see the U.S. dollar lose its position in the world. Um, if there's ever a point in time where countries and individuals no longer find that a 10-year treasury note is a safe investment, um, then, then we might see that. But um, even in this situation where the where ten year treasuries have been trading below one percent, people people are still moving into ten year treasuries because they they see it as a, a safe harbor for their money. So uh, I don't see 
this bringing about a, a one world currency anytime soon. Well, well we, we could, could briefly, briefly talk, talk about, about capitalism, capitalism in this case. case. Basically, Basically capitalism, capitalism is freedom, freedom. And capital will flow where freedom thrives and liberties thrive, where people have the right to choose what they want to do with their capital. And the more freedom that we have in this country, the more capital will come Amen, here. Amen, brother. And Trump has, pr Trump has proved that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do want to get back to um, like treatment and preventative measures for a minute because we've talked about how great this drug is, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, but we've also talked about the scarcity. Uh, then we talked about tonic water and zinc. And so anyway, the question is, right now, currently, what could the average American do uh, as a preventative? Vitamins, healthy diet, social distancing. What, what would you recommend that the average American can do right now to help prevent contracting it and to help prevent spreading it? Hey, hey, Scott, Scott can, can I, I take a crack, crack at this and, and you come sure, over? Sure, sure. Right? Yeah. All right. So the – and what I, what I want you to be thinking about, Scott, is a zytokine storm process that we've seen um, in some of the testing. But a lot of people are thinking that they should go out and just buy crazy amounts of natural immune boosters. Um, and there have been some studies and um, there have been a few cases where if there's an uh, – extreme or uh, uh, an immune response that is too strong that it can create a storm within your immune system that actually creates a stronger disease. Mm. So I wouldn't recommend that people, and I'm not a doctor, this is just my opinion, uh, but I think from the research that I've seen that it's not necessarily the right idea to go out right now and, and take a hundred times your daily dose of vitamin C to think that you're going to have this giant armor against catching this. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how strong your immune system is. If it doesn't recognize what the virus is, that's why the novel nature of this virus is so important is because even the healthiest of people are susceptible to it. That somebody who has a perfectly functioning immune system, their immune system is not going to recognize it right out of the gate. So um, I think being healthy, exercising, you know, take your vitamins, eat healthy, exercise, social distance, all those things are good. Uh, but I, from what I've seen, and Scott, you can, you can take it from here. I don't necessarily think it's a great idea to go ingesting large volumes of, of new substances. So the, the, the best way, obviously, to avoid getting infected is not being exposed to it. So that means isolation. And, you know, that's why they've been promoting this anti- uh, well, this social distancing and, and quarantine type of, of process. So not being exposed to it is, it's, it's, it's kind of like the contraception. If you know, abstinence is, is the best <laughs> contraception. <laughs> abstinence is in the, in this case is, is the best way to prevent getting the disease. If you're, if you don't get exposed to it, you're not going to get it. So that's a fact that, and it's not anecdotal. <laughs> I think that's, that's a fact, fact we, we can we can we can, we can sit, sit on. on. That's, that's a, a, I have a lot of confidence in that. You take that to the um, bank. That's right. You can take that into the bank. Now the cyto the cytokine storm that Brad's talking about that's um, that's an inflammatory response again, and that's the virus triggers that in inflammatory response, and the cytokines are chemicals that control the immune system, and those chemicals uh, are are triggered at such a high level, it causes a, a, um, a damaging immune response, a, a very severe inflammation. And that very severe inflammation leads to the disease itself. That's what causes all the problems, the pneumonia. Every, every disease we have ends with an itis, like arthritis, bronchitis. The, that means it's inflammation. And there, every disease practically every disease is infl inflammation is the underlying process. So mitigating that, controlling the, the immune response so that it doesn't cause disease and death is what doctors try to do. Unfortunately, doctors don't have a lot of, of um, treatments that are good for inflammation. You know, that's, it's something they, they treat symptoms more than they, they do the underlying cause. So, that's kind of my specialty. I've studied for years is try to try to mitigate inflammation by primarily 
abstinence. I mean, you don't want to trigger inflammation if you can. So you avoid do a, things that avoid triggering inflammation, like eating right. Because if you eat too much sugar, it triggers inflammation. Sugar is a is a known cause of inflammation. So don't eat a lot of sugar. Cut out the sodas, um, processed foods, candies, right. et cetera, the junk. Right. Yeah. It's not it's not cholesterol that causes disease. It's not a, obesity that's the cause of the disease. Those are symptoms. The underlying cause of heart disease is inflammation. So okay. yeah, it's inflammation. So controlling the inflammation um, in, a, in a disease like this coronavirus is, is vitally important. And that's why hydroxychloroquine is, is awesome because it, it does both things again. It stops the virus from replicating and it can, helps control the inflammation. So there are other things that can help with inflammation. There's drugs out there that can mitigate that they use for, I think, arthritis and maybe some other, other types of uh, inflammatory processes that that could be helpful um and and there are some supplements i've, I've got another i could probably myremedy.com i got another business that uh, <laughs> that i is all about inflammation and how to mitigate you know healthy diets and some supplements and things like that so that and the, the idea the idea there is is to again prevent prevent the trigger of inflammation by eating right and staying healthy sleeping well exercise um, and then also there's some supplements that actually do help. Uh, what, what it does is help, um, help your immune system control itself because your immune system has its own built-in control system. But when these diseases occur, occur the, they trigger it so powerfully that those, those control mechanisms uh, are overwhelmed and they can't do it. So it needs help. Let me, let me back up for just a second, Scott. Um, MyRemedy.com. Can you spell that out for us, and we'll put it in the comments. Yeah, it's M Y R E M D I. So my remedy is spelled E D E D I. It's spelled with an I instead of a Y, like remedy. Okay. Uh, when I when I tried to get when I tried to get that domain, my remedy was already taken, so I had to put an I on the end of it. Which is actually the la the original Latin word for remedy. Oh, so it so. works perfectly. Okay, so yeah, that's right. So my so for those of you watching, we're gonna fix the spelling in that uh, comment thread. Uh, but I'll go ahead and reiterate: uh, if you want to look into uh, an excellent source of information as far as preventing and mitigating disease and inflammation, you can go to oh, and it's fixed. You can go to myremedy com. That is M Y R E M E D I dot com. So that's another good source for preventing disease and inflammation. Um, and I think I think something important here is like, like and we we don't know for sure that you know these things are going to stop uh, or or help you with hydroxy or with uh, COVID nineteen. Um, but these are just good healthy practices that everyone should do anyway. Um, but with this particular illness, the hydroxychloroquine is showing to be the most effective in actually treating and stopping it with what we've seen so far. So yeah. I, I don't, I haven't, we haven't seen good evidence of other home remedies that no. are stopping this. No, this, no, that I agree. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I sell this stuff and I wouldn't be using that as treatment. I, I'd be jumping all over the hydroxychloroquine and zinc and, um, uh, and the azithromycin, for sure. And I don't know about in your guys' area, but I have friends that are doctors here. And hydroxychloroquine is available here in pharmacies, and it can be prescribed. So people shouldn't be too fearful that if they get sick that they can't get it, because my understanding is it is still in pharmacies. Um, but you, you aren't going to be able to just call up your doctor and say, hey, I'm going on a trip to... Uh, to Africa and I need some anti-malaria drug. I heard of this hydroxychloroquine. Can I get some? Uh, they're probably not going to give it to you now. Right. Uh, but if you were to test positive and were symptomatic and having trouble, it is available. So people should, should know that it is out there. And I, I'd, I'd repeat that uh, you, you want to use it early in the disease uh, cycle. You don't want to wait till you get severe. Don't wait till you, you struggle with breathing. Because because the the earlier you use it, the more effective it is. So in other words, let's try and be proactive instead of reactive. Yeah, exactly. Always a good plan. <laughs> now we've got uh, we've got another good question here, and 
you're basically saying, well, we can't isolate forever, which is correct. We can't. Um, will we all eventually be exposed regardless? I mean, we talked about looking into potentially the next 16 months. Um, and we've also talked about, you know, redefining BC, uh, you know, before coronavirus, after coronavirus. So um, they're saying, look, I understand flattening the curve, but are we looking at eventual worldwide exposure? Is this something that we're going to live with that will be recurring like an influenza? I mean, what are we looking at here? And, and how many people could be exposed to this? I think everybody will be exposed to it at some point. Point, you know, just a matter of time. That's that too. Everybody think, will be. They will be exposed to it. The big thing is is the, the that's the whole point of flattening the curve is that we don't think that we're going to be able to stop this thing from spreading, which is seeing cases anymore. Doing some of those things, it's really just about trying to limit the total severe cases so that our hospitals and our medical staff can keep up with it. So yeah, we are all at some point likely gonna come in contact with it. Or I think, I think the number I've seen is 80, 80 to 90%. Um, so there may be some that don't, but a large majority will. We just don't want that to be all in two months. We, we, we need to spread that out right. so we don't over overwhelm our systems. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they talk, talk yeah, yeah, they, they talk, talk about, about herd immunity, immunity which, which if, if, if approximately 80% or more of the people are immune to it, it slows down the spread to a point where those that last 10, 15, or 20% of the people may not be exposed to it. And that's one of the things they're, they're hoping for. And, and if you notice, there are some countries that tried that and failed pretty miserably, like the UK. UK. Yeah. <laughs> that was a huge mistake. They That was... Uh, that was bad. I I don't know what they were thinking. Oh, no, they weren't yeah. thinking. Well, in speech, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of Americans that have been proposing that, like, oh, we should all just come out of our homes and just get it and get it over with. And we can look at other countries that tried that. The UK uh, being the most prevalent one, and I believe in the most recent numbers that they're seeing a mortality rate that's 10 percent, which this that's just astronomical. So it it clearly didn't work there, and it wouldn't work here either. Well, and speaking of the UK, you know, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson got it and went to the ICU. So this also shows like, you know, no, as you've been stressing throughout this entire interview, this is a novel virus. Our bodies are naive to it. And clearly nobody is immune to it. We have one of the world's leaders in the ICU after contracting co coronavirus. Yep, exactly. Yeah, this well, the virus doesn't care what color your skin is. I mean, there there may be some genetic predisposition. Like there's there's some signs that blood type may actually have something to do with it. And uh, but in but this isn't a situation where only poor people are getting it or only rich people are getting it. This this goes everywhere. And was it uh, I think Steve Bannon may have said, or was it Fauci, uh, Scott, that said that you might not be interested in the in this virus, but it's interested in you. That, that was um, Bannon. That, that was Steve that was, Bannon. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, here, it, it, it doesn't matter who you are. This is, this is my, my, my uh, Ayn Rand favorite, favorite quote, quote, too. Is, you can avoid reality, but you can't avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. Mm. You, can avoid the, you can avoid this virus, but you aren't, you aren't going to be able to avoid the consequences of getting infected. That's a great point. It's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, I'd, I'd, I'd go back. back I'd go back to that question, question Dane. That, that person asked about how long are we going to have to deal with this? And we can't isolate forever. forever. I, I, I agree with that, that. And, and that's why you know I I I would like someone to consider. I'd like proposing that that, that um, controlled exposure, like I was talking about. If we were able to get enough hydroxychloroquine and manage it to the point where we can let people socialize and have that treatment available. Either, either prophylactically, like, like in, in the medical, medical staff, staff we talked about, about and, and or early treatment, early treatment of the, the early signs so that people are going to be, gonna we're going to need a lot of it, but let people, but let people socialize again and, and let this go through. Go through but the hydroxychloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine and that treatment, that treatment will, will prevent the disease from occurring. From occurring. It, won't cause it won't cause the severe, severe disease, especially when, especially treated, when treated prophylactically and or early in the disease cycle or the infection. 
Gotcha. So that's so I that's, think that's I think that's I think that's a, think that's a legitimate, legitimate proposal. proposal. I mean, we've, I mean, we've, we've done that at veterinary medicine in livestock in livestock production, production controlled, controlled exposures. So when, when we don't have, when a, we don't have a, a, vaccine a, a vaccine to use, the vaccine, the vaccine won't be ready in time. You know that you know that they keep talking about it. That's that's. We're all going to be we're all going to be exposed to it at that point. It's, it's, way, it's, too it's way too late. Vaccine's, Vaccine's not, not the not not the solution, not the solution to, this to this problem. I okay. That's I really appreciate the way you put that because it helps put things in perspective. If and when we get a vaccine, it will already be too late. So we shouldn't be looking to this as the solution, at least for right now. So the best thing you can do is again, use caution distance yourself socially, stay at home. Let's try and flatten this curve so our hospitals aren't overloaded. Uh, ev basically everyone will be exposed at some point, but let's try and stretch that out over a long enough period of time that we can handle it. Basically is what yeah. we're getting yeah. at, right? Right, right, right. Yep, and if, yep. And, know, if, and, if you know, and if, if we got, if brave, we got enough brave enough to really Really use, the really use the treatment prophylactically, hydroxychloroquine prophylactically, then, then we could be a lot, more, be a lot more aggressive about getting back to getting business. back to business, which would be great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. That's what everybody wants. Absolutely. Pretty everybody. much everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and those that, and those that, those that choose not to, not to I guess they can in, stay in, inside and, and isolate longer. longer. Yeah, but I mean, so. I really liked your your proposal on you know if people want to go out give them hydroxychloroquine you know i mean yeah, yeah. let, let it, it, it's, it's safe, safe it's safe cheap, cheap and, and, and inexpensive. inexpensive i mean it's it's it's, it's like, like you couldn't it's, it's like, like a godsend, godsend. You, you couldn't, couldn't ask for anything better in, in this situation, situation. and <laughs> I, I, I just shake my head, head. i'm like i don't you know the only the only issue i understand is is that uh well one it's now it's political but, but also the, the supply problem. problem. I, I understood the supply problem because that's how I like the toilet, toilet paper. paper. <laughs> right. It's, it's a demand. demand. There's, a, there's, there's a huge, huge demand, demand all of a sudden, and we don't have the supply for it. And, and I get that part. part. And that, that, that makes my proposal maybe maybe not uh, as feasible. But, but I think it could be feasible if you if you modified it so that a frontline medical staff, that was critical. I mean, we should put them on hydroxychloroquine right away so that they're protected because – I mean, it. There, there. Remember, if go back to my discussion about um, the infective dose. Those people are, are are exposed over and over and over again, and get a high dose, and that's why they have so many serious um, infections. Is because they they get a a whopping big dose because they're exposed to the people all the time and numerous times. Mm. So we need to protect them not only with masks and PPE. We need to pr protect them with a prophylactic treatment like hydroxychloroquine and zinc. zinc. I would agree. And, well, Scott, you have a daughter who Brad is married to, uh, who was a nurse <laughs> and was on those front lines. Yeah. So both of you kind of know what they're, to some extent, what they're going through right now, what they're facing on a daily basis. And uh, I do think it's extremely important that we put them at the top of the priority list. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. And, that, and, that's and that's kind of our, our uh, bottleneck, too. too. I mean, we, we need to keep, to keep, keep that front line. line. They're, they're, they're on, on the front line, line of this battle, battle and we need to keep them healthy. healthy. And um, I think we could use a lot of prayer in the nation right now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, think, I think that helps quite a bit. Um, that is all the questions I have got for now. So I want to give you guys the floor here. Scott, is there, is there anything else you'd like to talk about or any uh, instructions or recommendations that you would give to our viewers at this point? Well, well I, think I think we've, we've, we've done, done a pretty, pretty good job touching, touching on, on about everything, everything that I can think of. of. Yeah. yeah. I, just I just reiterate, reiterate you know, Isolation is absolute protection, protection but, but you can't do that, that forever. forever. Um, there, there is a great treatment out there. I'm not, I'm not sure about all supplies everywhere in our country, country so you have to be kind of careful, careful about that. that. Um, so, so I would, I would probably. I, you know, here, here's, here's a good thing. thing. I, I would make sure I seek out a doctor that's using that treatment and not, not 
I, I would do that ahead of time because, because if I ended up getting, up getting sick and I have a doctor that would not prescribe that to me, that, that would, would I would be pretty, pretty upset. upset. That, that would be, be very frustrating. frustrating. So, so probably, probably one, one, one thing of preparation would be seek somebody in your community that's, that's willing to do that, that treatment in, in case you come, come down, down with it. That's an excellent point. Thank you. What about you, Brad? I think um, we need to be careful, like I said earlier, that this comes in waves. And I think we may be seeing a, a peak in certain regions and certain cities where we're going to start relaxing these things because we, we've seen a peak. Um, and I think it'll start to come back down. But we all just need to be aware that the virus is still out there and we should still consider continue to be careful and vigilant uh, and not think that just because case numbers are, are coming down and death rates are coming down in the short term that we're done with this forever uh, because we haven't done anything to actually uh, rid ourselves of this virus. We're, we're really just controlling um, it, its infection rate. So um, we just need to be careful and vigilant really for for a considerable amount of time. So, so don't, don't get lax just, just because things, things are getting better. better. We should be grateful, be happy, happy things, things are getting better. better. I'll continue to hope for the best, but I wouldn't stop uh, being, being vigilant and preparing just, just in case. case. Absolutely. And I'd add, I'd add those, those are great points. And I'd add kind of, kind of dovetails with this is that, you know, when I think there, we think, well, I just get it over with, get exposed to it and get immunity and go on with life. And then I'm, I'm, studying this virus and the things it can do to you and the sequela that I talked about before, the long life lasting sequela, you know, you could get fibrosis in your lungs. You can have some remnants you could maybe be latent and cause undulant fever. So it could be a lifelong problem in some people. So I'm like, I don't really think I want to get exposed to this. So before, before we, before, before we really have, have a good handle, handle on this thing, thing I, I, I would be, be, I would be cautious, cautious especially if you're, you're Older, I'm, I'm 62, 62, for example, example and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in that age where I have to be careful. careful. Um, and, and yeah, I, and even, even then, I, I just, I, I, I well, when this, when this whole thing started, started I would say, when in, when in doubt, doubt, err on the side, side of caution with, when, when dealing, dealing with this thing, because we, we don't know enough about it. And and so, you know, it was prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And it, and it seems like, like the worst, worst is kind of showing up. up. And I'm, I'm not being dramatic. dramatic. I'm just saying that it, on, that on that spectrum, it, it, it's, it's on the bad side. side. We, don't we don't know, know enough about this virus, virus um, and all, all the details and what, what, what sequela, sequela and whatever, whatever else, else it can do over time. time. So, so I, I respect it and err on the side of caution whenever you can. That's why we've worked hard to prepare and tried to keep from being exposed to this well, and on the heels of what you and Brad have both said, as far as erring on the side of caution, and that we may be looking at a peak, but these things come in waves, I think it's very important to put this whole situation into perspective. And uh, one of the things that I'm referring to specifically is timeline. So I know that being locked in our houses on a daily basis makes it feel as though this has been going on forever. It, uh, it distorts our perception of time. But the reality is we're just getting started and this is a novel virus and our bodies and immune systems are completely naive to it. We're only a few months in at this point, four or five months, I guess. Uh, so there's still a, a world of information that we don't know. So I, I, agreeing with what Brad had said previously, just, just because we see uh, a, a decrease in cases doesn't mean that we're out of the woods yet. So also going back to what you've said, Dr. Scott, it's, it's so important to err on the side of caution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stay, stay, stay safe. safe. Absolutely. <laughs> There's one other thing I wanted to mention really quick. Um, we, because we've been talking about reliable sources that uh, aren't putting bias or, or slants or tilts on it. Uh, and, and we name dropped Steve Bannon earlier. Um, Steve Bannon has been very diligent on his research and uh, the information that he's putting out. 
Uh, for those of you watching, uh, we've already recommended the Epoch Times, that is E-P-O-C-H Times. Uh, on YouTube, they have uh, the first documentary on COVID-19 with a very detailed timeline. I think that's a great uh, video for you guys to watch. But also, Steve Bannon has a podcast called War Room Epidemic. And, and Brad, you're actually more... Or pan. Or pan. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah War, War Room, room pan Pandemic. War Room Pandemic, yep. Steve and he's, Bannon. And he's... And he's, he's, he's he started that, I believe, Scott, back in January. So he has been on this way early. He had experts on in early February and January about the the possibility for shortages in pharmaceuticals. And he had the CEO of the only plant in the United States that makes N95 masks. He had that guy on. <laughs> so he's had really, really good guests. Uh, and that's something that people want to do some research. Um, that That is information that was not uh, given with any bias at that point. Like the, the mainstream media had not latched onto this. It had not become a political football yet. So a lot of that data and information that was coming out in late January and early February is some of the best to really help you understand the virus because there wasn't any politics at play yet in the United States. Uh, and a lot of it that's come out after is, is really heavily influenced by politics. We'll have to go back and li listen to the early... Um episodes of that because it's kind of interesting it was similar to you and i our relationship because there's somebody in china i can't remember who it was that he he really trusted and this guy put steve bannon you know on track and said hey this is something serious because the you know the chinese are acting this way and when they do that this you know it it means something and and that really, you know, Steve Bannon had a lot of trust in that in that gentleman, and I can't remember who the name is. We'll have to go back and see if we can find that. But, but that trust led him to do a lot of research, and that let that got him started early, and he and he took it and ran with it and did a great job. Yeah. And the guy that with Peak Prosperity, um, what's his name, Scott? Uh, I think it's Chris Martinson. I think yeah, Chris Martinson yeah. has a YouTube channel called Peak Prosperity. Uh, mm -hmm. He does almost a daily video and has been for 70 plus days. Um, mm -hmm. And so he is, uh, he has his doctorate, I believe from Duke. Um, he's very knowledgeable and has given very unbiased, just straight up. Here's the facts. Um, and here's what we're seeing from around the world. And he's, he's yeah. been really important for helping to follow the progression of this virus. Yeah. He's, he's done a great job. Yeah. Gentlemen, I'm going to switch gears here for just a second because uh, I would be disappointed in myself if I didn't go back and touch on this topic. Um, Brad, earlier you mentioned that uh, negative knowledge is more important than positive. In other words, knowing what you should right. not do is more important than knowing what you should do. And we know there's a lot of should not do's right now, and you specifically mentioned eating out. I want to talk about that because I think that's important. We still have people that are doing pizza deliveries where there's a face-to-face -face exchange at the front door. Um, I, now, I, I love my community. I am pro small business all the way, so I'm not going to mention any names. I don't want to hurt anybody's business. I'm just going to say that I have picked up a takeout order recently from a restaurant where the cook staff, the wait staff, um, there was no protection whatsoever. There was no masks, there were no gloves. And uh, again, it was a face-to-face -face personal exchange well within six feet. That's, that's disturbing to me in, in the food service yeah. industry. And as I said, I'm, I'm not bashing any local restaurants. We're all trying to survive. We're all trying to get through this together. And I understand if, if you can stay open and operate, you want to do that. But at the same time, we're talking about people's lives. It's more than just money. Absolutely. We're talking about life and death. So, so, so go ahead. Yeah. I've got, uh, I got, uh, I got three, I got 3% left on my phone. So if I disappear, <laughs> I didn't die. I just, my phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so absolutely. I own, um, with some partners, uh, a, a small chain of coffee shops. And, and we closed on March 23rd because of what I was seeing. And uh, our, our business had suffered to the point that we really weren't profitable. Uh, we were putting our employees at risk. We were inviting patrons into our space and, and we couldn't ensure that, that somebody wasn't infected. Um, and so we made that decision for the safety of our employees and patrons. Um, 
since then, I found out that we actually personally know one of uh, a customer of ours who was in our stores on a regular basis uh, that has since tested positive. And the timeline would show that that person likely tested positive or, or contracted the illness within a matter of days after we closed. So if we have, would have remained open for an additional week, uh, it's highly likely that our staff would have been exposed to the, to the virus at some point. So, oh, thanks. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you watching, um, that's Hannah Lepper. Um, that's Dr. Scott Taylor's daughter and Brad Lepper's wife. <laughs> and she she's, is, she's trying she's to bail me out. Awesome. Yeah. She's a great woman. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think that it's... <laughs> um, People, people have to have remember, to remember that, that one of the ways that virus is spread is through fomites, which is basically, which is basically a, surface a surface that has been, that has been, touched, and has been and touched and has been infected, been infected and then somebody and comes along and touches it afterwards. afterwards. That's, That's one of the one main of the ways the virus, virus is spread. spread. So, so the, the, the restaurant industry and takeout food is, uh, we, we're literally um, uh, in the business of selling fomites. I mean, we're in cups, we're handing trays, we're handing food. And if... Uh, if, the uh, if the person that prepared, prepared the, food the food is, uh, is, infected, is infected, then, then that, that tray that they're giving, that they're giving out of that, out cup, of that could cup could be as could well, be as well. Which, which, um, we just have, um, to, we be just have to be extremely careful. careful. You know, we you may know, be we able may to take precautions. Take precautions. Uh, we're, uh, we're still roasting, roasting at our coffee shop, in our lab, our roast lab, because we have one guy who roasts, um, when he's packaging, he wears a mask and he wears gloves and, um, we're pretty confident that he's safe. So we're able to still roast coffee, but some of these, some places of these places are, are, are delivering to people. To people. Uh, they're, allowing they're allowing people to people carry out carry of their out facilities. Of facilities. Uh, and, and that is just, that is just I think, an, I think unnecessary an unnecessary risk. risk. Um, um, and it's and sad it's what sad I'm, seeing I'm seeing in our, in our, our business, com business community, community where, where we're really, really trumpeting, trumpeting and, and encouraging all the businesses, all the businesses that, are that are fighting through this and saying, you know, get out and support small business. These people are out there and still fighting and still open. And we really, really, on on should be giving should be some giving credit some to the business, business who are, who are taking, taking precautions, precautions to help slow the spread, spread and, are and are willing to give up the profits, who are willing to take, to a, take a little bit of time, time out and recognize, and recognize them for what they're what doing because that, that is really what is slowing down the spread of this virus. virus. Uh, they, uh, they, the government the is not government telling us that we can't have people in our lobbies to just try and make it more difficult for us to make money. They're doing that so that we help to social distance, not get more creative with how do we come in contact with the same amount of people, but just a different Way. way so, so everybody, everybody needs, needs to be needs careful, to be careful with, that. with that absolutely yeah that's yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, an, that's interesting an interesting topic you know and it's kind of like after 9 11 how security became a big thing yep. after 9 11 well, after after this pandemic biosecurity is going to be huge in the future that's you know people say well when are we going to get back to normal we're not going to go back to the old normal we're going to go forward to a new normal it's going to, things, things are going to be, be different in the future. In the future. People, are going, people are going to be more concerned. concerned. People are going people to be more concerned, concerned about, about biosecurity and things, and things like, that. like that. So again, yeah, we're yeah. looking at a post coronavirus world. Oh, we lost you for a Great. second. We got Great. you back. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm back. I'm uh, back. I was at 1% and then I plugged, then I plugged in. in. So I'm all good. Right. All right. Um, I think that's all I've got guys. You've been extremely generous with your time. This has been very informative, very enlightening. And uh, for those of you watching, again, on the top left, we have Brad Lepper. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, business owner. He's got a chain of coffee shops, real estate developments, and investments. And Brad, I give you kudos for closing your business when you did. I agree with you. We should commend the businesses that are taking this seriously and foregoing profits to save lives. Also uh, with us in the top right, this is Dr. Scott Taylor, who has made, uh, well, has had a career studying viruses, diseases, inflammation, and vaccines. Uh, I certainly hope that you all have gained a lot from this interview. Uh, again, gentlemen, I, I greatly appreciate your time. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, visiting with you, and Scott, it was great to meet you. You too, Dane. You too, Dane. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Uh, Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Well, hopefully we can do this uh, again soon. In the meantime, I want you all to stay safe, stay inside, and stay informed. And when I, stay, when I say stay informed, make sure you get it from the right sources. We will be posting some of those in the comment thread 
below. So thank you again and uh, God bless.